Hello, everybody. This is the Chocolate News Podcast. I'm your co-host, John Alexander Reese. And I'm your co-host, Andrea Carter. And if you didn't know, the Cincinnati Herald has been around since 1955 and is the leading African-American-owned newspaper in the greater Cincinnati area and northern Kentucky area. And today we have a lot of special guests with us. So first of all, we have Cohere founder and CEO Donnie Eisenson with us. How are you doing today, Donnie? I am doing great. Great to be here. Thanks, John. Cool. No problem. Glad to have you. We also have City Councilman Reggie Harris with us. How are you doing today, hey, Reggie? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. We also have City Councilwoman Mika Owens with us. How are you doing today, Mika? I am great. Thank you so much. It's uh, nice to be here. It's lovely to have you here. We also have candidate for Juvenile Judge Raquel Howard-Smith with us. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you for having me. No problem. Now, before we move on to our main topic, we have some chocolate news to um, take care of. So, Andrea, what is the chocolate news of the week? Well, the, the, this has been a very interesting um, chocolate news week because I've been watching a couple of things. I'm going to start off with the most historical event that is going on right now. It will continue to go on for a, for a little while is the death of Queen Elizabeth and how the country is going through its mourning process. And of each step of the way, there have already been two small services for the queen, um, both in Scotland, where, which she loved to, um, at the right outside of Bearmore Castle. And then there was a ceremony today in, no, actually there was two. The, no, there was one in, in, Bear, in Scotland. There was another service honored in her memory in Belfast, with King Charles. And then there was, a, I'm sorry, a third one today because her body went from Buckingham Palace with the family walking behind it to um, the hall, the great hall that's uh, not that far away from Buckingham Palace to lie in state for the next four days. And people have, were gearing up and going to walk past her body. I believe the family again will at some point during those four days um, stand guard of the body again. His, and as I said, history is being made this week because there's never been a state funeral like this before seen by the by England and the world this time um, since the death of her grandfather, which made her father king, which put her in line for the throne. And now we are 70 years later for this to happen again. But also, I think we need to take a step look at the significance of what this means with Queen Elizabeth's death those countries that are part of the Commonwealth are now taking a look at do they truly want a monarch to be the head of their um, country and do they want to remove their connection to the kingdom, to the English crown, um, with King Charles coming on board. And um, especially um, some of the nations um, like Jamaica have already started talking about how they want to become a republic and they want reparations from England for all that they've done regarding slavery. So that's gonna be an ongoing conversation as they go through mourning the death of Queen Elizabeth and then waiting, awaiting the coronation of King Charles III. So that's one thing. And there's gonna be more on the Herald website about this um, because there have been a number of articles by Jamaica, The Voice, which is the English black newspaper, and a couple of other on-site black newspapers who are covering this issue. So we'll be um, pulling together a story that everyone can come to our site and read in the next couple of days. So there's that. Then there was the wonderful Emmy moment with Cheryl Lee Ralph, who was the second black woman to win the Best Supporting Actor role for a comedy. And she, this is the first time she's being nominated as an Emmy. She's a fabulous actress. I've seen her in all kinds of um, character roles. And she sang her acceptance speech. Um, she sang Endangered Species on stage, which was one of the more memorable highlights of the moment of the Emmy Awards. Congratulations, Cheryl Lee Ralph. I hope to see more of her acting abilities continue to be both on streaming broadcasts and up on the movie screen yeah um and i'm just glad um also the showrunner for uh, abbott elementary which is the show that sherry lee ralph won her emmy for um quinta brunson she won well she also stars in the show and as a showrunner she won for best writing 
for a comedy series. So I thought that was fantastic. Oh, I, missed, I missed that. I, I didn't really. She won for best writing. That's yeah. Fantastic. Well, the reason why everyone is talking about it because uh, Jimmy Kimmel uh, was doing a comedy bit that I thought went on way too long. He was just laying on the stage as she was giving her speech. And a lot of people thought that was disrespectful. And um, I do agree that was a little disrespectful. I don't think, you know, I know some comedians try to stay committed to the bit, but I thought that went on a little bit too long. You got to let her have her moment. But Quinta then seems so upset about it. So, you know, it's fine. But I'm just glad um, she won for best writing because that's a, that's a very prestigious war award, obviously, in television. Well, Jimmy Kimmel, he's always been a little bit unusual in his comedic <laughs> style. So I'm not surprised that he did that. But one more thing. Also, Zendaya won again for Euphoria. So this is like the second time really? that she won for lead actress in the drama series. So she's the youngest person to ever do that. So I just think that was amazing also. But that's all I got to say about that. Okay. Well, real quick, um, the sad moment for us as a Bengals fan God bless the Bengals. Yeah. Um, they lost their season opener against the Steelers. Boo. But anyway, <laughs> um, it, it, it was it was an interesting game to watch because it kept you on your edge. The Steelers were continually showing the weaknesses and the flaws in the Bengals. But what I found appealing, which I still think they're on track to go to the Super Bowl, is because how they bounced back and fought back to not only tie up the game, but even though they didn't challenge a couple things, they had a couple of misses field goals, um, so the Steelers, but they countered and held the Steelers to the end. And the only way the Steelers won that game is because of a field goal. The Both the defense and offense look stronger. Some, uh, some work still needs to be done. A little tweaking needs to be done. But overall, I think the team that we saw last year is there. They just need to tweak a little rough edges to get where they want to be. And I think we're going to see it in the next few games. So that's what I have to say about the Bengals. I certainly um, hope so. That's all I got to say. Cause that was a, uh, that game was kind of a well, heartbreaker. I, it was a heartbreaker, but I, but I was looking more at throwing uh, tackling, um, how they were responding to the fumbles, how they were responding to just going down the field back and forth. And what I found is that, you know, some teams will cr get crushed and just walk away or they'll give up. You kept seeing everyone bounce back and bounce back and bounce back. And the only thing that was thrown was the kicker because he had a new snapper and whoever that guy was should never have been a snapper. And they actually took someone from their practice squad to become the interim snapper until the guy gets, um, he comes off the injury list. So I, I think that rectified that situation so they won't have that again. So, um, but overall, I believe in, this, in the Bengals and I think they're going to have a good, a good, a very good season. But last but not least for our chocolate news, it's a little heartbreaking for me as a fan of a number of anchor people. Bernard Shaw died. Um, if anyone watched the early years of CNN, CNN had a harder stance than a more of opinionated stance that they have right now. And he was hard hitting, ball busting type of anchor that you want to see on the air, asking the tough questions and not afraid of the response and the reaction to what he said. He was an old school journalist who was on TV and he told it like it was. And um, he could pick up and go anywhere and interview um, just about do just about anything. And I thought it's kind of sad to see him go um, because he was a great, great, great journalist. But people need to look at his old stuff and learn because you can learn from his style, how he looked at an issue, how he interviewed. Um, he's kind of like the black Peter Jennings to me. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and I mean, Peter Jennings was my idol. Um, the closest I ever got to Peter Jennings was guy got to sit at his chair on his chair for a minute touring ABC News when I was a college student. Hmm. So, but I admire how Peter Jennings was able to walk into any given situation without notes and conduct an interview and do it intelligently. Bernard Shaw was the exact same way, and it's rare to find people who can be able to do that without notes. 
Mm. So um, it's sad to see him go. But we, we um, I was at a journalist convention earlier this year, and there's a number of good young people coming up in the industry that I believe we'll see another Bernard Shaw or a woman like him come on top and do that type of type of journalism again. So I'm hopeful for the industry. And that is our chocolate news for today. All right. Well, thank you, Andrea, for all that chocolate news. So now we're moving on to our main topic. And today we are talking about the future of the political party, both locally and statewide, and how we how we're going to shift our trajectory, you know, for the better. And uh, once again, I want to reintroduce all of my people. Founder and CEO of Cohere, Donnie Isison. We have city council member, Reggie Harris, city councilwoman, Mika, Mika Owens. And we also have candidate for juvenile judge, Raquel Howard-Smith. Uh, I just want to thank all of you guys for coming on the show. Greatly appreciate it. I, I would just say I'm going to start out with a general question. And I, I guess since we are talking about the future of democracy and the, the political parties per se, what is your, you know, what is it? How do you feel about the future of the political party and elections right now? Anybody can start. Sure. Well, this is Reggie Harris. Um, I, I mean, if we're thinking... I'll start local and expand. And locally, I mean, I, I, I would say I feel very optimistic, optimistic about the future of the Democratic Party in Hamilton County. I think with uh, the election of the new city council, uh, including the mayor, we have one of the most diverse councils, I believe, in the history uh, in the city of Cincinnati. And we have a new electorate of new body of officials that are um, not new to politics and being engaged, but new to elected office. And so I think that that's really important um, in thinking about sort of a new era of folks who are in positions of power. Uh, I think statewide, our Democratic Party, we have some challenges, but we have, you know, um, some talented young folks like my my dear friend Dunny that is uh, really working to be able to change that statewide. Um, and then nationally, uh, that's the whole just sort of can of worms that I won't tackle. I'll let uh, Mika or Raquel or Dunny speak to that. Uh, and, and I don't, but I think that if we think about the Republican Party, I'm, I, the city of Cincinnati is really, I think, at a, a pivotal moment in which the balance of power has shifted, at least politically, um, from being sort of uh, Republican to slightly Democratic to being a good mixture to being a majority and solidly uh, democratically ran city and region. Um, and I really think that that's for the best, um, looking at some of the work that we're doing around equity and in, in both housing and um, representation in government and protections, uh, et cetera. So that, that's that's how I'm sort of thinking about the, the parties and, and the future. Well, I, I mean, the city of Cincinnati has gone through an evolution of power structure, of who's been in charge from Republican to Democrat to Independent. We've had a number of different, I would say a number of different, we have different council members we've reflected a different ideologies, political ideologies. Um, how do you think the city government, because it's, we have a very youthful council, and when I say youthful, I mean in terms of being, I think except for maybe one member, everyone's under the age of 50, or no, under the age of 40, I believe. Is that true? It, I think that's somewhat accurate. I, I think there's a majority of us who are probably like, 50 and under, and then a, a small minority who are um, a little bit older than that. Um, but to the, and I don't know what your, your final question is, but, you know, I think to the point of a young um, city council, uh, people who have been in office for the first time and just what the future of the party means at a local level, I think this is our opportunity to, just to build on my colleagues' um, points around diversity uh, representation, I think this is the, the time where the local party, we get to really understand what engagement looks like, because, you know, often we leave at uh, just what registering people to vote or 
not really making the connection around why voting locally in every election, of course, but why voting locally matters because it's the everyday uh, impact um, that we that we have on on folks. And so I think that is the the broader opportunity for us um, so that people can uh, understand that, you know, the things that we are working on and that we are doing as an elected body coming from various backgrounds and experiences, it is it is for the people. Um, who largely, you know, look like us um, or who have similar experiences. And so these are the things I get excited about. And just to go back to your original question, too, I think at a national level, our opportunities are more around messaging and what bringing uh, people into democracy really means. And so as a Democratic Party, um, I think coalescing around something that is broader uh, than issues and, and and more related to what citizenship um, really really means and how that drills down to the local level. Well, when I was starting to say, the reason I was focusing on the youth of city council and also somewhat the, the youthfulness of other people in our political spectrum is that because the youth, everyone's saying youth will lead and your perspectives on the political process, do you think is more intense or more open and engaging of the community than ever before? This is, uh, Danny, I'll jump in on this, um, both as a current candidate for the State House, uh, but also as someone who uh, has been thrilled to see and support uh, the new city council and mayor. I think a lot of what the council members were talking about gets exactly at that question, both about you know, you know, a sense of youthfulness in government, but more importantly, what the future of the party is, which is that we can have that the future of the party depends on people feeling engaged in the way that Councilwoman Owens was just describing. And they feel so much more engaged when there are elected officials like the two council members on this call, when there are candidates like Raquel Howard Smith, who are actually both from the communities they're serving, but also deeply committed to them and are there in the community every day doing the work, showing people that government can make a meaningful difference in their lives. And when you build that bridge, at the local level with people in their neighborhoods and in their cities, that's how you start to reinvigorate a sense of part civic participation and engagement and even civic leadership in just everyday citizens. And that's the work over the long term, I think, that gets at some of the changes that Councilmember Harris was talking about statewide in Ohio, that if Democrats want to win statewide and establish more power in the legislature to advance our, our values, we need to do the work of making people feel more invested in the system and like the system can work for them. And I'll just share a, an anecdote about what I mean from this morning. You know, I saw at the Walnut Hills candidate fair uh, when Raquel, who I'll, I'll maybe wants to describe it more, but Raquel Howard Smith was there and she was talking to these young high school students who at, you know, are both of our alma mater, uh, Walnut Hills, about being a lawyer, about what it means to be in the fight for social justice, about why she wants to be a juvenile judge. And you could see their wheels turning and their eyes lighting up and thinking, oh, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. This is why that matters. And that interaction right there, that to me is the is the future of the party. Oh, that was so sweet, Danny. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to jump in and just kind of piggyback off of um, you know, what you said around engagement. Um, I also think that um, voters, our constituents want to see action um, uh, much quicker than they have before. Uh, I think in past um, years, you know, you vote for someone and then elected officials sort of disappears behind the curtain and makes decisions. And then you don't find out until it's something that negatively impacts you. And I think now voters, um, across the board are a lot smarter um, in holding elected officials accountable to what they say when they're campaigning. Um, and that just ties into what you said around, you know, doing the work in the community ahead of time or having a track record for standing behind the values that you speak for. I think that once folks are elected in office, and this goes across party lines, but it's especially for the Democratic Party, people are like, you said you would do this now let me see it. I need to feel it. I need to know that you are actually in that position working on uh, my behalf. And I think that um, at least for the folks that I know that are on the call right now, 
we are all very in tune to that and committed to making sure that that action is seen and heard and felt. And I guess what I was getting to is the part of the youthfulness of the party and local government is because in the past, the political parties both were more parent to the child. Do as I say, don't do as I do. Yes, I'll take care of your issue. And then you don't ever see them again. Now it seems what's taken um, because of what has happened over the last 10 years, and especially the last administration, people are demanding more action, more engagement. And it's not so much that top-down approach, but more of a bottom-up grassroots approach um, because more people are involved in the political process. Would you agree about that? I, I would agree with that. But I would also say that, and, and just want to offer a slight reframe, I think, I think often in politics, we talk about candidates and future leaders um, as and their styles being in response to institutions, in response to things that have happened in the world, rather than thinking that there's actually a different and new ethos and leadership. So there are leaders that are seeking to uh, lead in different ways and lead in more collaborative ways and lead in more action-oriented ways. And, and frankly, it's one of the things I'm really excited about being on the call with Councilwoman Owens and Dunny um, and Raquel, because if you look at, for, for them, and I would include myself, uh, at our previous careers and the things that we have done in our careers, I think that they are in line with a shift to thinking about authenticity, equity in, it, in voice, equity of experience, um, power sharing, building a, building a bench of leaders. And so it's not just that there was this way that politics existed. And so we decided to come and change that, but we are who we are. And we then want to occupy these spaces um, in ways that feel authentic to our experience. I would say with what has been happening over the last few months regarding politics, not just locally, but nationally, you know, everyone was expecting this red wave to catch it, catch the midterm elections, going to be this huge change. And then all of a sudden, it's not. And now it looks like the Democrat Party may hold on and even gain some seats to hold both the House and the Senate. Do you think that is a possibility? Um, I know the political landscape is still in flux. Um, people are still trying to decide some things that are going on, but women are making sure they're registering to vote in record numbers around the country, especially in Ohio. What happened with the Supreme Court and Roe v. Wade has d undoubtedly had an effect on the political spectrum. What do you think is gonna happen where are the where are the constituents right now who you're out talking to on the campaign trail? What are they telling you what they most want to see from you as a candidate expecting to win office? And what you what what you what should you be doing once you get there? I can jump in on this, and then I don't know as the the other active candidate, Raquel. Maybe you have a different perspective on the judicial side, but I think you hit um, you hit it pretty squarely that the. The issue that has really taken just unbelievable and, you know, understandable salience over the last few months has been access to reproductive health care and abortion and, and reproductive justice for uh, and since the Dobbs decision since overturning Roe that has been just at the forefront of a lot of people's uh, attention and energy and concern and, and activism and so you know, have seen a ton of movement there and also cost of living continues to be the thing that people bring up um, consistently. And then I would say probably third, but you know, of huge importance in a lot of different communities, uh, is the continued um, scourge of gun violence, both handgun violence, gun violence, death by suicide, and you know, the fear of mass mass shooting events. Uh, so those are probably the three that voters talk about the most when I'm out on the trail. And I will um, chime in too as a judicial candidate. I don't often get to speak on um, policy issues in that role um, uh, just to maintain impartiality. Uh, when I'm elected to the bench, I'm going to speak it into existence. However, in my current role, I am an advocate. Um, I'm a civil rights attorney um, as well. So 
I when I talk to folks about the courts in particular, um, their biggest concern is they have no clue what happens in our court system and, until you actually have to step foot in that courtroom. And then often you leave with no sense of what happened to you. You know, you know, either you go to jail or you don't, but you really are not squarely in tune with your rights and, you know, uh, who's representing you, a whole myriad of things. And I, I think that from our justice system in particular, the people are demanding um, transparency. They're demanding accountability from um, judges and the system as a whole to answer to why they make the decisions that they make. Um, you know, we can't change the law um, or once elected as judge, I can't change the law, but how am I making my decisions to apply the law? How am I making sure that those decisions are fair? Um, in addition to that, just want to make one comment on a policy side, because even though I'm running for um, judge, people want to talk to me about um, Roe um, and Dobbs and things like that. I often can't comment, but I am a civil rights lawyer, so I can educate them. And just a quick plug, I did just published an article with the Cincinnati Bar Association on the future of reproductive health care here in Ohio, where I laid out the current landscape of what we should expect in, in the next few months. And, and my final conclusion there is that it's really going to be up to the voters, um, these midterm elections, what the future of reproductive health care looks like in Ohio. Um, so I, I'm hoping that voters feel empowered by that you said that you know record number of women registered i hope that they're registering to vote to actually change or or make a decision as to what that future should look like for us um and then finally this is a conversation happening amongst constitutional scholars um which is a fancy way to say you know lawyers that protect people's rights is that because there's this huge um fight between states' rights and federal rights. You know, we are predicting a, as a, a legal community that people will start to move to those states where they feel like there are more progressive views, where they are more protected, where, like Dunny said, the cost of living is at least manageable. But, you know, states um, that are severely restricting people's voting rights, reproductive health care, um, some of these issues that are in the forefront, people may just decide to move to another state where they can enjoy life and be free. Well, I mean, that, that's an interesting statement because Lindsey Graham this week has introduced a um, bill to ban abortions up to ban abortions up to 15 weeks in all 50 states. And I mean, people are just now starting to hear about it, see about it. But I mean, the, he's he, again, it's an older man trying to bring the hammer down on one, I'm going to be a little cold, on a medical issue that no government should be deciding the fate on. Just the woman, the man, and her doctor. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges with, you know, I, I think one of the, and, and I, this, it, it gets to a, a larger sort of issue of like how in the US, right, you have these highly contentious views that are really sort of binary, right? And then, um, and you, and leaders have to make a decision to be okay with a group of people essentially losing, right? Like the, the access to, you know, reproductive health care. Uh, and access to abortion is either you believe that is a choice or you believe that it isn't, and there is no, you know, middle ground or in between. And I think that this is, you know, you really begin to sort of see, even when you hear people's arguments for and against, and I happen to be a very much pro-choice, uh, women's reproductive right believer and champion, but you start to see pe people's arguments and the, I believe one of the challenges is you have this very highly contentious topic and you have a topic that has been politicized for and used to score political points and just has become extremely toxic. And so now it's almost a little bit like the dog that caught its tail. 
you see that um, the, the movement that has been trying to overturn Roe, they arrive at that space and then the backlash is really severe and it actually does not, from a political standpoint, uh, get folks the things that they thought it would get them. And so then you see these sort of like attempts at compromise, which again, you know, in my opinion, is sort of a binary um, choice where you have this 15 week ban and it's in, and so you, so I think we're gonna see a lot of this like waffling from the right, recognizing how um, this has, in some ways had a really negative impact on their political agenda. And I guess I'll ask you this, because of what has been happening nationally, and we continually hear on the various news programs about democracy is in danger if certain things occur, from a local level to a state level, is our democracy on this, on a local level, a concern? Or is that more of a national concern? I don't see how you separate the two. I'm not sure I should comment on which way I feel on whether democracy is uh, in jeopardy. But um, what I will say is if if they are both dependent on each other, we are all we can create what we consider to be a utopia or something close to it here in the, the great county of Hamilton, city of Cincinnati. Uh, however, if things are happening on a federal level, like what you just advanced, then they're gonna affect every resident of this country. Um, and, and in most cases, it disproportionately affects someone, right? Um, whether that is uh, people of color, black people, women, et cetera. So I don't think that you escape that just because you are building a movement from a local standpoint. I think they're totally dependent on each other. Um, and, and, you know, we, we have to focus on shifting those power dynamics on the local, state, and federal level. Well, how much should voters uh, ask this? Because I'm trying not to mention the, um, the extremism that we have seen and witnessed across the country or um, viewpoints of 45, I refuse to say his name, um, and the people who follow him. But I'm going to say the impact of actions of the extremes, extremes, extremism that we've seen, how much is that gonna play in the midterm elections where people need to do their homework to decide, do we want this or do we want that? What would you recommend? It's gonna play a huge role. Um, and this is why elections matter, every election matters. And so I think from an institution, a big tent party, you know, I am an organizer and a civic engagement enthusiast at heart. And so it's being able to break down the power structure so that people see themselves in the system. And when we begin to explore and expand that more, that's when things begin to transform. And so if people don't see themselves in, let's just say, the opportunity of choosing, uh, of, of choice and, and looking at this election and looking at what people are saying about how we keep our, our community safe. You know, this is a consequential election as everyone is. And so this is going to come down um, absolutely to turn out uh, for, for that reason. Well, so. how much of what we're seeing is people want the extreme or how much is people reacting in fear of change and people being different from them? Feel like that that is a question for folks who identify as extremists or that we would you know categorize as extremists both uh dunny and i had the privilege of participating in the leaders in light inaugural uh, cohort which is a leadership program hosted by the jcrc here in cincinnati and we explored for over a year topics around extremism and how extremist groups develop how, how do you you know turn from being just you know an average person living your life to having extremist views and um although there are many factors that contribute to it uh, that is the foundation of my answer i feel like that that question may be better answered by someone who holds those views or who participated in you know, January 6th. That, that is how you get some insight into why things are that way. 
I think um, from the opposite view, because I don't identify as someone who is aligned with those thoughts, you know, my role is to protect my personhood, my community, my city, um, and the civil rights of others through all of this. And part of what I'm able to do um, is to step up and run for office myself. Um, so that I know that there's someone on the bench that are making decisions that are rooted in equity and fairness and accountability. The other piece of it is I, I exercise my right to vote um, to as, as far as I can to make sure that people who um, appear to have extremist views don't get in a position where they are making um, decisions and making policy on my behalf because they don't represent me. Well, I'm... I'm... I guess the reason why I was saying is because my my basic belief is I have a right to say and criticize because I get up and I vote, whether it's the primary or whether it's the general election. Long as I check my ballot, I get to I get to say something. Those who don't and go, eh, you know, it's on them. Um, but I would say be, since we're we're slowly running out of time. What would you tell voters going into the November election? I mean, soon we're looking at, we're not that far away from early voting. What would you tell voters right now to do as we go get ready to, to see the outcome of this election about 30, what, you know, about 50 days from now? That is, uh, that's the, the big question. I mean, I think from my perspective, the number one thing locally is get to know the candidates running. You know, for we have an incredible slate of people running uh, for judge. Uh, those important those positions. If if we didn't know they were important before, we know they're important now uh, in the post Dobbs world. So, uh, you know, we have a really exciting group of people running for state the state legislature, uh, and including a really diverse uh, group of people running both for the state house and the state senate. Uh, we have the most competitive congressional race uh, in Ohio in the first district with Greg Landsman running. And then obviously we've got um, a lot of great statewide candidates, including Nan Whaley, the first woman running for governor uh, in Ohio, uh, for nominee from a major party, and Tim Ryan running for Senate. And so I think if the message to voters is that they not only should try and get to know the incredible candidates who are running, but also you know think about what are what is the issue or two issues that they most want to see, you know, different in the country and in the in the city and the state and which candidates can make an impact on it. We have we saw because Georgia elected the 49th and 50th Democratic senators, we got the first black woman on the Supreme Court. We have the largest infrastructure bill in US history, the first major climate change uh, legislation. Uh, so these elections have a huge impact on both our short and long-term futures. And so I think the message to voters is, you know, figure out which candidates align with you and what issue gets you out of bed in the morning and, and you know, vote accordingly. Well, I thank you for that. I know it's been a little out there um, um, in, in this discussion, but I guess basically what I was trying to make sure everyone understood what was going on, what everybody's view, viewpoint is, and get involved locally. Because city council needs your help to help run the city. They need to hear from you. This is, this is a very engaged. I think we're very lucky with the city council that we have right now because you are more engaged than I've ever seen before. I mean, more council members are out and about in the community than I've ever seen. And I think that's fantastic. And I, I believe um, that we're going to see some great things from the city council. And also the many candidates that are running, I think the, our future is bright and idealistic. And I think that's fantastic for our democracy because that's what we need both locally and on the state level. Um, John? Thank you, Andrea. That was a very fascinating discussion, everyone. I was definitely very captivated by it. And um, for anyone listening to this, you need to vote. It, now's not the time to be passive. Election day is Tuesday, November 8th. Please vote, it's your future, please do it. And um, that's all I have to say about that. But I wanna thank Andrea John. for coming. Oh yes, of course. I was just going to I was just going to add w one additional thing um just you know Dunny I think laid it out really well is the intri intrinsic question that people have to ask does this person reflect my values um the other piece too is people really understanding what consuming media looks like and so being able to go to trusted sources news outlets nonpartisan outlets that will be able to provide information um, about candidates so that people can make informed choices like League of Women Voters, uh, 
ACLU and, and so so many other organizations that that put that information out there. And then to your point, um, Andrea, you know, it's about showing up. And I think when people make the first step to say, you know what, I am curious about this candidate, I'm going to show up to their event or this rally, or you know what, I believe enough in this person to go knock doors or make telephone calls. All of those things make a difference because democracy is a participatory sport. It's not a spectator sport. So showing up makes a difference. Well said, Mika. Well said. And uh, like I said, Andrea, I want to thank you for coming on and discussing all that good chocolate news. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I also want to thank uh, Cohere founder and CEO and also candidate for state representative in the District 24, Donnie Isison. Thank you for sharing your thoughts today and coming on. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me, John. Good to talk to you again. Good to talk to you, too. I also want to thank City Councilman Reggie Harris for coming on and sharing his thoughts today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. I also want to thank Cincinnati City Councilwoman Mika Owens. Thank you for coming on and sharing your thoughts on today's show. Thank you. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. and Thanks for providing this outlet. And finally, I want to thank the candidate for Juvenile Court Judge Raquel Howard-Smith. Thank you for coming on and sharing your views also. Thank you. And everybody, don't forget to vote for the judges on the ballot. Yes. And just in general, please vote Election Day, Tuesday, November 8th. Exercise your right to vote. You are a U.S. citizen, so please vote. And you can find more information about today's topics and past podcast episodes at www.thecincinnatiherald.com, the SESH newsletter, or on our social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, folks, if you're looking for a free online uh, webinar on home ownership, Owning It, Cincinnati and Dayton 2022 will be taking place on Saturday, September 24th from noon to 1.30. The link for that event will be in the podcast description. And make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. Our podcast is on Apple, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, Amazon, YouTube, and Google Podcasts. In addition, the Cincinnati Herald is now looking for news distribution and delivery agents please contact our publisher, Walter White, at 513-680-7076 for more information. I'm John Alexander-Reese. I'm Andrea Carter. And have a good day.